Welcome to Listening to the Giants, Episode 2. Welcome to the Listening to the Giants podcast, Episode 2. I'm your host, Dale Lewis. Today we begin the first book on the Listening to the Giants podcast, which is Thoughts for Young Men by J.C. Ryle. Now, some of you may not be familiar with J.C. Ryle, So before we begin the book, let's take a couple of minutes and learn a little bit about him. John Charles Ryle was the oldest son of John and Susanna Ryle, and he was born in Macclesfield, England, on the 10th of May in 1816. Growing up, he enjoyed and excelled in both sports and academics, receiving recognition and honors in both. The Ryle family were nominal Anglicans, and J.C. Ryle had the same mindset toward Christ and Christianity as his parents. However, that changed when in 1837, while he was at college, he suffered a severe chest infection. It was then that he began to read his Bible and pray earnestly. Then, one Sunday at church, he heard Ephesians chapter 2 being read. He said that his eyes were opened when he heard verse 8 being read, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The simple reading of that passage of Scripture was used by the Spirit of God to convict J.C. Ryle of his sinfulness and bring him to saving faith in Christ. Ryle's college studies had been in preparation for a career in politics. In fact, After getting his college degrees, he went to London to study law. However, in the providence of God, Ryle's recurring illness, coupled with the failure of his father's bank and the loss of financial support, brought about a complete change of direction. A career in the Church of England was available to him because he had a degree from Oxford. So in 1841 and 1842, Ryle took holy orders and began his ministry at the Chapel of Ease in Exbury, Hampshire. He became rector of St. Thomas's Winchester in 1843, and then rector of Helmingham, Suffolk, in 1844. He moved to Stradbroke, Suffolk, in 1861 as vicar of all saints. It was during his time in Helmingham that Ryle began to publish popular tracts and eventually books. He wrote several well-known books which are still in print today. Two of Ryle's books, which are very popular today, are Expository Thoughts on the Gospels and the book Holiness. Another important and still popular book by J.C. Ryle is the first book we are featuring on Listening to the Giants. And that book is, of course, Thoughts for Young Men. Now, in Thoughts for Young Men, Ryle, exhibiting great pastoral concern, addressed the spiritual dangers which young men face, and he also provides biblical remedies. Now, I need to mention that even though Ryle focuses in on young men in this book, the book is beneficial to anyone who reads it and takes its message to heart. Sinclair Ferguson noted concerning this book that, quote, all Christians, men or women, young or old, can read it with lasting benefit. It deserves to be widely read and circulated and will do spiritual good to every reader. Now, with that endorsement, let's begin listening to the Giants. Thoughts for Young Men by J.C. Ryle Introduction When St. Paul wrote his epistle to Titus about his duty as a minister, he mentioned young men as a class requiring peculiar attention. After speaking of aged men and aged women and young women, he adds this pithy advice, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, Titus 2.6. I am going to follow the apostle's advice. I propose to offer a few words of friendly exhortation to young men. I am growing old myself, but there are few things I remember so well as the days of my youth. I have a most distinct recollection of the joys and the sorrows, the hopes and the fears, the temptations and the difficulties, 
the mistaken judgments and the misplaced affections, the errors and the aspirations which surround and accompany a young man's life. If I can only say something to keep some young man in the right way, and preserve him from faults and sins which may mar his prospects both for time and eternity, I shall be very thankful. There are four things which I propose to do. One, I will mention some general reasons why young men need exhorting. Two, I will notice some special dangers against which young men need to be warned. Three, I will give some general counsels which I entreat young men to receive. 4. I will set down some special rules of conduct, which I strongly advise young men to follow. On each of these four points I have something to say, and I pray God that what I say may do good to some soul. Reasons for Exhorting Young Men In the first place, what are the general reasons why young men need peculiar exhortation? I will mention several of them in order. For one thing, there is the painful fact that there are few young men anywhere who seem to have any religion. I speak without respect of persons, I say it of all. High or low, rich or poor, gentle or simple, learned or unlearned, in town or in country, it makes no matter. I tremble to observe how few young men are led by the Spirit. How few are in that narrow way which leads to life. How few are setting their affections upon things above, how few are taking up the cross and following Christ. I say it with all sorrow, but I believe, as in God's sight, I am saying nothing more than the truth. Young men, you form a large and most important class in the population of this country. But where, and in what condition, are your immortal souls? Alas, whatever way we turn for an answer, the report will be one and the same. Let us ask any faithful minister of the gospel and mark what he will tell us. How many unmarried young people can he reckon up who come to the Lord's Supper? Who are the most backward about means of grace, the most irregular about Sunday services, the most difficult to draw to weekly lectures and prayer meetings, the most inattentive under preaching at all times? Which part of his congregation fills him with the most anxiety, who are the Rubens for whom he has the deepest searchings of heart? Who in his flock are the hardest to manage? Who require the most frequent warnings and rebukes? Who occasion him the greatest uneasiness and sorrow? Who keep him most constantly in fear for their souls and seem most hopeless? Depend on it. His answer will always be the young men. Let us ask the parents in any parish throughout England and see what they will generally say. Who in their families give them most pain and trouble? Who need the most watchfulness and most often vex and disappoint them? Who are the first to be led away from what is right and the last to remember cautions and good advice? Who are the most difficult to keep in order and bounds? Who most frequently break out into open sin, disgrace the name they bear, make their friends unhappy, Embitter the old age of their relations, and bring down gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Depend on it. The answer will generally be the young men. Let us ask the magistrates and officers of justice, and mark what they will reply. Who go to public houses and beer shops most? Who are the greatest Sabbath breakers? Who make up riotous mobs and seditious meetings? Who are oftenest taken up for drunkenness? breaches of the peace, fighting, poaching, stealing, assaults, and the like? Who fill the jails and penitentiaries and convict ships? Who are the class which requires the most insensate watching and looking after? Depend on it. They will at once point to the same quarter. They will say, the young men. Let us turn to the upper classes and mark the report we shall get from them. In one family, the sons are always wasting time, health, and money in the selfish pursuit of pleasure. In another, the sons will follow no profession and fritter away the most precious years of their life in doing nothing. In another, they take up a profession as a mere form, but pay no attention to its duties. 
In another, they are always forming wrong connections, gambling, getting into debt, associating with bad companions, keeping their friends in a constant fever of anxiety. Alas, rank and title and wealth and education do not prevent these things. Anxious fathers and heartbroken mothers and sorrowing sisters could tell sad tales about them if the truth were known. Many a family, with everything this world can give, numbers among its connections, some name that is never named, or only named with regret and shame. Some son, some brother, some cousin, some nephew, who will have his own way and is a grief to all who know him. There is seldom a rich family which has not got some thorn in its side, some blot in its page of happiness, some constant source of pain and anxiety. And often, far too often, is this not the true cause, the young men? What shall we say to these things? These are facts, plain, staring facts, facts which meet us on every side, facts which cannot be denied. How dreadful this is, how dreadful the thought, that every time I meet a young man, I meet one who is in all probability an enemy of God traveling in the broad way which leads to destruction, unfit for heaven. Surely, with such facts before me, you will not wonder that I exhort you. You must allow there is a cause. For another thing, death and judgment are before young men, even as others, and they nearly all seem to forget it. Young men, it is appointed unto you once to die. And however strong and healthy you may be now, the day of your death is perhaps very near. I see young people sick as well as old. I bury youthful corpses as well as aged. I read the names of persons no older than yourselves in every churchyard. I learn from books that, excepting infancy and old age, more die between 13 and 23 than at any other season of life. And yet you live as if you were sure at present not to die at all. Are you thinking you will mind these things tomorrow? Remember the words of Solomon, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Proverbs 27.1 Serious things tomorrow, said a heathen to one who warned him of coming danger, but his tomorrow never came. Tomorrow is the devil's day, but today is God's. Satan cares not how spiritual your intentions may be and how holy your resolutions, if only they are fixed for tomorrow. Oh, give not place to the devil in this matter. Answer him, no, Satan, it shall be today, today. All men do not live to be patriarchs like Isaac and Jacob. Many children die before their fathers. David had to mourn the death of his two finest sons. Job lost all his ten children in one day. Your lot may be like one of theirs, and when death summons, it will be vain to talk of tomorrow. You must go at once. Are you thinking you will have a convenient season to mind these things by and by? So thought Felix and the Athenians to whom Paul preached, but it never came. Hell is paved with such fancies. Better make sure work while you can. Leave nothing unsettled that is eternal. Run no risk when your soul is at stake. Believe me, the salvation of a soul is no easy matter. All need a great salvation. Whether young or old, all need to be born again, all need to be washed in Christ's blood, all need to be sanctified by the Spirit. Happy is that man who does not leave these things uncertain, but never rests till he has the witness of the Spirit within him, that he is a child of God. Young men, your time is short. Your days are but a span long, a shadow, a vapor, a tale that is soon told. Your bodies are not brass. Even the young men, says Isaiah, shall utterly fall. Isaiah 40, 30. Your health may be taken from you in a moment. It only needs a fall, a fever, an inflammation, a broken blood vessel, and the worm would soon feed upon you. There is but a step between any one of you and death. This night your soul might be required of you. 
you are fast going the way of all the earth. You will soon be gone. Your life is all uncertainty. Your death and judgment are perfectly sure. You too must hear the archangel's trumpet and go forth to stand before the great white throne. You too must obey that summons, which Jerome says was always ringing in his ears. Arise ye dead and come to judgment. Surely I come quickly is the language of the judge himself. I cannot, dare not, will not let you alone. Oh, that you would all lay to heart the words of the preacher. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Ecclesiastes 11.9 Wonderful that with such a prospect any man can be careless and unconcerned. Surely none are so mad as those who are content to live unprepared to die. Surely the unbelief of men is the most amazing thing in the world. Well, may the clearest prophecy in the Bible begin with these words, Who hath believed our report? Isaiah 53, 1. Well, may the Lord Jesus say, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Luke 18, 8. Young men, I fear lest this be the report of many of you in the courts above. They will not believe. I fear lest you be hurried out of the world and awake to find out too late that death and judgment are realities. I fear all this, and therefore I exhort you. For another thing, what young men will be, in all probability, depends on what they are now, and they seem to forget this. Youth is the seed time of full age, the molding season in the little space of human life, the turning point in the history of man's mind. By the shoot we judge of the tree, by the blossoms we judge of the fruit, by the spring we judge the harvest, by the morning we judge of the day, and by the character of the young man we may generally judge what he will be when he grows up. Young men, be not deceived. Think not you can, at will, serve lusts and pleasures in your beginning, and then go and serve God with ease at your latter end. Think not you can live with Esau and then die with Jacob. It is a mockery to deal with God and your souls in such a fashion. It is an awful mockery to suppose you can give the flower of your strength to the world and the devil, and then put off the king of kings with the scraps and leavings of your heart, the wreck and remnant of your powers. It is an awful mockery, and you may find to your cost the thing cannot be done. I dare say you are reckoning on a late repentance. You know not what you are doing. You are reckoning without God. Repentance and faith are the gifts of God, and gifts that he often withholds when they have been long offered in vain. I grant you true repentance is never too late, but I warn you at the same time late repentance is seldom true. I grant you one penitent thief was converted in his last hours, that no man might despair. But I warn you only one was converted that no man might presume. I grant you it is written, Jesus is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, Hebrews 7.25. But I warn you, it is also written by the same Spirit, because I have called and ye refused, I will laugh at your calamity, I will mock when your fear cometh, Proverbs 1.24-26. Believe me, you will find it no easy matter to turn to God just when you please. It is a true saying of good Archbishop Leighton, The way of sin is downhill, a man cannot stop when he would. Holy desires and serious convictions are not like the servants of the centurion, ready to come and go at your desire. Rather, they are like the unicorn in Job. They will not obey your voice, nor attend at your bidding. It was said of a famous general of old, When he could have taken the city he warred against, he would not. And by and by, when he would, 
he could not. Beware lest the same event befall you in the matter of eternal life. Why do I say all this? I say it because of the force of habit. I say it because experience tells me that people's hearts are seldom changed if they are not changed when young. Seldom indeed are men converted when they are old. Habits have long roots. Sin once allowed to nestle in your bosom will not be turned out at your bidding. Custom becomes second nature, and its chains are threefold cords not easily broken. Well, says the prophet, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Jeremiah 13, 23. Habits are like stones rolling downhill. The further they roll, the faster and more ungovernable is their course. Habits, like trees, are strengthened by age. A boy may bend an oak when it is a sapling. A hundred men cannot root it up when it is a full-grown tree. A child can wade over the Thames at its fountainhead. The largest ship in the world can float in it when it gets near the sea. So it is with habits. The older, the stronger. The longer they have held possession, the harder they will be to cast out. They grow with our growth and strengthen with our strength. Custom is the nurse of sin. Every fresh act of sin lessens fear and remorse, hardens our hearts, blunts the edge of our conscience, and increases our evil inclination. Young men, you may fancy that I am laying too much stress on this point. If you had seen old men, as I have done, on the brink of the grave, feelingless, seared, callous, dead, cold, hard as the nether millstone, you would not think so. Believe me, you cannot stand still in the affairs of your souls. Habits of good or evil are daily strengthening in your hearts. Every day you are either getting nearer to God or further off. Every year that you continue impenitent, the wall of division between you and heaven becomes higher and thicker, and the gulf to be crossed deeper and broader. Oh, dread the hardening effect of constant lingering in sin. Now is the accepted time. See that your flight be not in the winter of your days. If you seek not the Lord when young, the strength of habit is such that you will probably never seek him at all. I fear this, and therefore I exhort you. For another thing, the devil uses special diligence to destroy the souls of young men, and they seem not to know it. Satan knows well that you will make up the next generation, and therefore he employs every art betimes to make you his own. You are those on whom he plays off all his choicest temptations. He spreads his net with the most watchful carefulness to entangle your hearts. He baits his traps with the sweetest morsels to get you into his power. He displays his wares before your eyes with his utmost ingenuity in order to make you buy his sugared poisons and eat his accursed dainties. You are the grand object of his attack. May the Lord rebuke him and deliver you out of his hands. Young men, beware of being taken by his snares. He will try to throw dust in your eyes and prevent you seeing anything in its true colors. He would fain make you think evil good and good evil. He will paint and guilt and dress up sin in order to make you fall in love with it. He will deform and misrepresent and caricature true religion in order to make you take a dislike to it. He will exalt the pleasures of wickedness, but he will hide from you the sting. He will lift up before your eyes the cross and its painfulness, but he will keep out of sight the eternal crown. He will promise you everything, as he did to Christ, if you will only serve him. He will even help you to wear a form of religion, if you will only neglect the power. He will tell you at the beginning of your lives, it is too soon to serve God. He will tell you at the end, 
it is too late. Oh, be not deceived. You little know the danger you are in from this enemy, and it is this very ignorance which makes me afraid. You are like blind men walking amidst holes and pitfalls. You do not see the perils which are around you on every side. Your enemy is mighty. He is called the Prince of this world, John 14.30. He opposed our Lord Jesus Christ all through his ministry. He tempted Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit and so brought sin and death into the world. He tempted even David, the man after God's own heart, and caused his latter days to be full of sorrow. He tempted even Peter, the chosen apostle, and made him deny his Lord. Surely his enmity is not to be despised. Your enemy is restless. He never sleeps. He is always going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is ever going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. You may be careless about your souls. He is not. He wants them to make them miserable, like himself, and will have them if he can. Surely his enmity is not to be despised? And your enemy is cunning. For near six thousand years he has been reading one book, and that book is the heart of man. He ought to know it well, and he does know it, all its weakness, all its deceitfulness, all its folly. And he has a store of temptations such as are most likely to do it harm. Never will you go to the place where he will not find you. Go into the towns, he will be there. Go into a wilderness, he will be there also. Sit among drunkards and revilers, and he will be there to help you. Listen to preaching, and he will be there to distract you. Surely such enmity is not to be despised. Young men, this enemy is working hard for your destruction, however little you may think of it. You are the prize for which he is specially contending. He foresees you must either be the blessings or the curses of your day and he is trying hard to effect a lodgment in your hearts thus early in order that you may help forward his kingdom by and by. Well does he understand that to spoil the bud is the surest way to mar the flower. Oh, that your eyes were opened like those of Elisha's servant in Dothan. Oh, that you did but see what Satan is scheming against your peace. I must warn you, I must exhort you, whether you will hear or not, I cannot, dare not, leave you alone. For another thing, young men need exhorting because of the sorrow it will save them to begin serving God now. Sin is the mother of all sorrow, and no sort of sin appears to give a man so much misery and pain as the sins of his youth. The foolish acts he did, the time he wasted, the mistakes he made, the bad company he kept, the harm he did himself both body and soul, the chances of happiness he threw away, the openings of usefulness he neglected. All these are things that offer and bitter the conscience of an old man, throw a gloom on the evening of his days, and fill the later hours of his life with self-reproach and shame. Some men could tell you of the untimely loss of health brought on by youthful sins. Disease racks their limbs with pain, and life is almost a weariness. Their muscular strength is so wasted that a grasshopper seems a burden. Their eye has become prematurely dim, and their natural force abated. The sun of their health has gone down while it is yet day, and they mourn to see their flesh and body consumed. Believe me, this is a bitter cup to drink. Others could give you sad accounts of the consequences of idleness. They threw away the golden opportunity for learning. They would not get wisdom at the time when their minds were most able to receive it and their memories most ready to retain it. And now it is too late. They have not leisure to sit down and learn. They have no longer the same power even if they had the leisure. Lost time can never be redeemed. This, too, is a bitter cup to drink. 
Others could tell you of grievous mistakes in judgment, from which they suffer all their lives long. They would have their own way. They would not take advice. They formed some connection which has been altogether ruinous to their happiness. They chose a profession for which they were entirely unsuited. And they see it all now. But their eyes are only open when the mistake cannot be retrieved. Oh, this is also a bitter cup to drink. Young men, young men, I wish you did but know the comfort of a conscience not burdened with a long list of youthful sins. These are the wounds that pierce the deepest. These are the arrows that drink up a man's spirit. This is the iron that enters into the soul. Be merciful to yourselves. Seek the Lord early, and so you will be spared many a bitter tear. This is the truth that Job seems to have felt. He says, Thou writest bitter things against me, and makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Job 13.26 So also his friend Zophar, speaking of the wicked, says, His bones are full of the sins of his youth, which shall lie down with him in the dust. Job 20.11 David also seems to have felt it. He says to the Lord, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. Psalm 25, 7. Beza, the great Swiss reformer, felt it so strongly that he named it in his will as a special mercy that he had been called out from the world by the grace of God at the age of 16. Go and ask believers now, and I think many a one will tell you much the same. Oh, that I could live my young days over again, he will probably say. Oh, that I had spent the beginning of my life in a better fashion. Oh, that I had not laid the foundation of evil habits so strongly in the springtime of my course. Young men, I want to save you all this sorrow if I can. Hell itself is truth known too late. Be wise in time. What youth sows, old age must reap. Give not the most precious season of your life to that which will not comfort you in your latter end. Sow to yourselves rather in righteousness. Break up your fallow ground, sow not among thorns. Sin may go lightly from your hand or run smoothly off your tongue now, but depend on it. Sin and you will meet again by and by however little you may like it. Old wounds will often ache and give pain long after they are healed, and only a scar remains. So may you find it with your sins. The footprints of animals have been found on the surface of rocks that were once wet sand, thousands of years after the animal that made them has perished and passed away. So also it may be with your sins. Experience, says the proverb, keeps a dear school, but fools will learn in no other. I want you all to escape the misery of learning in that school. I want you to avoid the wretchedness that youthful sins are sure to entail. That's our podcast for today. I hope that you enjoyed it and found it beneficial. Chapter 2 of Thoughts for Young Men will be posted in two weeks. If you subscribe to Listening to the Giants on your favorite podcast platform, you'll be notified when the next episode is posted. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. You can also visit the Listening to the Giants website at listeningtothegiants.com. There you will find links for subscribing, past episodes, some helpful links, and you can leave us a message. Thanks for listening today. I hope you will join us next time as we listen to the Giants. <laughs>